Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with a cherry tomato and cheese galette. That's right, do not let that fancy French word at the end scare you. A galette is nothing more than a free-form pie or tart made without a pan. And while it's a perfect delivery system for all the same fruits you put in pies and tarts, today we're actually going to use it to feature sweet cherry tomatoes, which of course are also a fruit. So I think what I just said is that this technique is good for fruit as well as fruit. And now that everyone's clear with that, we can go ahead and get started with this very simple crust, which I'm going to do in a food processor, but you don't have to. And I'll explain how in the blog post. And what we'll do is toss in some all-purpose flour, along with a couple tablespoons of cornmeal, which I'm not exactly sure why I added, but I'm glad I did. And then we'll also need to toss in some salt, as well as one stick of unsalted butter that I cut into cubes and stuck in the freezer for about 20 minutes. All right, one of the keys to this crust success is using very, very cold butter. And then once all that's in there, what we're gonna wanna do before we put any wet ingredients in this is pulse this on and off until we have something that resembles coarse crumbs. In other words, until we have something that looks like this. And because we froze our butter first, what you're seeing here is thousands and thousands of little pieces of butter coated in flour, instead of like a paste made from butter and flour, which is what's gonna happen if the butter's too warm. And then once that's set, we can finish this with our wet ingredients, which is a little touch of cider vinegar, plus a nice big splash of ice water, or just very, very cold water. And that's it, we will simply pulse this on and off again until it all comes together. And if we're using my dump all the liquid in at once technique, we're gonna wanna stop after like five or six pulses and scrape down the sides. All right, the other method for this is you turn the machine on and then you slowly drizzle in the liquid from the top, but using that method, I think there's more of a danger to overwork the butter. So I prefer this method. And once we have those sides scraped down, we'll continue to pulse it on and off until we achieve what we call in the business clumpification, which is basically gonna look something like this. All right, a lot of recipes say do it until a dough ball forms, but that's too much. Okay, we wanna stop before it becomes a ball of dough and it's still sort of in loose clumps like this. But if we give it a little press, it sticks together very easily. And then what we'll do once that's been accomplished is carefully transfer that onto some plastic wrap. And we'll sort of press it and push it together with our hands to form a lump. At which point we can go ahead and wrap this up and then flip it over. And then we will use the plastic to help us finish forming this into basically a disc of dough. We should not be confused with disco dough. And that's it. We can now simply transfer that into the fridge for about an hour or until thoroughly chilled. And while we're waiting, we can move on to make our cheese filling which for me is gonna involve about a half a pound of fresh goat cheese, to which I'm gonna add one egg yolk. And of course, I'm gonna save the white for an egg white omelet. And yes, of course I'm kidding, there's nothing worse. And then we'll also go ahead and season this up with some kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper, as well as a few shakes of cayenne. And then last but not least, a whole bunch of freshly sliced basil, also known as sweet summer tomato's best friend. And then we will take a spatula and give this a mix. And by the way, if you're not into goat cheese, anything with a similar texture will work, so use what you want. I mean, you are after all the Jesus of your cheeses. Give it a second. But anyway, the point is that things like farmer's cheese or ricotta or cream cheese will also work here, just not as extraordinarily well as goat cheese, which for me just has the perfect tanginess to pair with those sweet tomatoes. And then what we'll do once that's been spatulated into a very smooth, soft mixture is set that aside, and we'll move on to rolling our dough. And assuming our dough has been chilled thoroughly, we'll go ahead and transfer that onto a floured surface, as well as we will generously flour the top. And then what we'll do here is attempt to roll this out into a circle that's approximately an eighth of an inch thick. And if you're using one of these 12 inch pizza pans like I am, that means rolling it out about an inch or so bigger than that. And then once we feel like we've rolled that out big enough, what we'll do is roll it up on our pin like this, which makes it a lot easier to transfer onto our pan without tearing or otherwise mangling it. And by the time this dough has been rolled out and transferred onto the pan, it's probably warmed up to almost room temp, which is a little warmer than we want to work with it. So what we'll do at this stage, because we want to work with it cold, is transfer that into the fridge while we prep our tomatoes. And by prep, I simply mean cut in half. And this will work with any cherry tomato. But if you can find this mix of what they call toy box tomatoes, I think that's gonna make this glut look extra beautiful. And the amounts are gonna be a little tricky for something like this, but I'll say we need about three cups to begin with. And then what we'll do once those have been sliced and transferred into a bowl is toss them with two things. 
some extra virgin olive oil, which is not surprising, plus one teaspoon of Dijon, which I guess could be sort of surprising. But it's a proven scientific fact that mustard makes baked tomatoes taste better. So we will go ahead and mix all that together. And no, we didn't forget the salt. Okay, I think if we salt these now, it will pull out too much water. So what we'll do if it needs more salt is sprinkle some on after it's baked. And that's it, once we have that mixed, we can set it aside and pull out our chilled dough and we'll go ahead and spread on our cheese mixture. And it's probably unnecessary because this filling is so soft, but because we don't want to tear the dough, what us high-end pastry chefs will normally do is go ahead and sort of distribute the filling by spoonful and then spread it out with a spatula. And basically that just gives us a little head start. But regardless, we'll go ahead and spread that out as evenly as possible, leaving approximately an inch and a half unspread around the outside, around the outside, around the outside. And that's it. Once our dough has been cheesed, we can go ahead and transfer on our tomatoes. And please note, I'm using a slotted spoon to do this, so as not to transfer on too much liquid, which there shouldn't be too much because we just cut these. But better safe than soggy. Oh, and if there are any liquids left in the bowl, make sure you drink them or dip a crust of bread in it because those are gonna be insanely delicious. And then what we're gonna do once our tomatoes have been transferred on and any spots needing a tomato have been filled, we'll go ahead and form our galette by folding up and over the excess dough, creating a pleat every three inches or so. Okay, so just go around as shown, sort of folding and gently pressing, and then turning the pan two or three inches and doing it again until we get to that last fold. Oh, and if you were tempted earlier to trim the edge of the dough, to make it all perfectly neat, because you're one of those people? Don't do it, it's not necessary. Okay, not only are these slight irregularities not gonna matter, they're actually gonna make it look better once this is baked. And that's it, once our galette is formed, we only have a couple things to do before it goes in the oven. The first of which would be to paint the dough all over with an egg wash, which is simply an egg beaten with a couple teaspoons of water. And then we will finish this up with a very light dusting of Parmesan cheese. Of course the real stuff, Parmigiano Reggiano except no substitutes. And that's it, once that's been grated over, this is ready to transfer into the center of a 425 degree oven for about 30 minutes or so, or until very well browned, and hopefully looking a little something like this, which I think looks absolutely gorgeous. And by the way, when I said browned, I didn't just mean the top and the sides. The bottom needs to be golden brown as well, so don't be afraid to peek. And that's it, we are now faced with the hardest part of this recipe, waiting for this to cool down completely. All right, this is not good hot. It is not good warm. But room temperature or chilled, there is nothing better. So for the sake of this video, let's just say that's what I did. At which point I garnished with a little bit of basil so I could take some pictures. But truth be told here, the sun was going down, so I was kind of forced to cut into this while it was still a little bit warm. I mean, it was close, but it wasn't quite room temp, which is why things are going to seem a little bit soft, because they are. Okay, once this cools, the cheese is going to firm up, and our tomatoes are going to get nice and jammy. But having said all that, this still really was outstanding. Okay, the combination of that buttery, flaky crust with that little bit of gritty crunch from the cornmeal, plus that savory, herbaceous, tangy cheese, which is just a marriage made in heaven for those incredibly sweet tomatoes. And by the way, these tomatoes were super sweet before they went in the oven. But once roasted, especially with a little bit of Dijon on there, they basically turn into candy, except without the guilt. And since this was a tad warm, I did go with the fork, but if you let this cool down all the way, you should be able to eat it like a slice of pizza. Especially if, as directed, you make sure that bottom crust gets browned. Okay, so please be sure to bake this long enough. Oh, and I did forget one thing to show you, because I was so taken by this thing's beauty and deliciousness. But once this cools down, before you serve it, it's not a bad idea to drizzle the top with some olive oil, as well as a nice sprinkling of sea salt. Okay, our crust is seasoned and our cheese filling seasoned, but I do find a little bit of extra salt on top does help bring out all the flavors even further. But anyway, that's it. What we're calling cherry tomato and cheese galette. This is dedicated to everyone out there that planned that one extra cherry tomato plant and are now trying to figure out how to use all those up. But whether you grow your own or have to buy some, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.